the subject of today's discussion is the upcoming holy day, Rosh Hashanah. And the obvious difficulties, we'll see they're pretty obvious, when we try to understand what the Bible has to tell us about them. In particular, of course, as always, I feel compelled to stress that while Rosh Hashanah and all of the rest of the biblical holy days are generally known as Jewish holidays, I prefer referring to them as biblical holy days, not because they're not Jewish. Of course, the Jews observe these holy days as given by God in the Bible, but we realize they have messages for everyone who believes in God's word in the Bible, both Jews and non-Jews. And of course, our mission is to try to pull out of the text as many of these messages as we can. So it is on that note that we embark upon considering what this holy day signifies, in particular, by considering, of course, the passages in the Bible that talk about it. Now, in the Torah, the five books of Moses, this holy day appears exactly twice, in Leviticus chapter 23 and Numbers chapter 29. We'll also consider one additional passage from much later in the Bible that is relevant here. But first, the passages from the Torah. Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 23, and God spoke unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall be a solemn rest unto you, a memorial proclaimed with the blast of horns, a holy convocation. Now again, this is the first instance in which the holy day that we know as Rosh Hashanah, the new year, appears. And of course, what is glaring in this statement is both what it states and what it doesn't state. What it does state is that this holy day takes place, of course, in the seventh month. What it doesn't state is that it's a new year. And indeed, we would well question, how could it be a new year if it's taking place in the seventh month? Now, that's one issue. And of course, inevitably, that issue is so central and so glaring, that's going to be our initial discussion, trying to understand what makes this day altogether into Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year, if it's in the seventh month. We also need to consider what the text tells us about the nature of this holy day. And of course, the answer is not a lot. All we're really told is this central motif, the blast of horns. That is the blowing of the shofar, except the text doesn't even refer to the ram's horn. It doesn't say anything about the shofar. It refers in the Hebrew to teruah. Teruah meaning a blast, as in a blast of a horn, as this becomes a central theme of this holy day. But of course, besides trying to explicate what the word means, what is the theme? What does it teach? What's the message? Obviously, are additional questions we're going to need to address. Now, I noted that in the Torah, we have two passages. The second one is largely a reiteration of the same themes. In Numbers chapter 29, verse 1, again, and in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no manner of servile work. It is a day of the blast of the horn unto you. The blast of the horn. Once again, teruah in Hebrew. Once again, most glaringly, it's taking place in the seventh month, 
and there's no reference at all to it being a new year. I already noted that there is one additional passage in the Bible that explicitly refers to this date. It is from much later on. Indeed, it's from the Second Temple period in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we read at the beginning of the chapter, all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the broad place that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the Torah of Moses, which God had commanded to Israel. And in verse 2, here's where we see the date. And Ezra the priest brought the Torah before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. So here we have it once again. Not a new year, rather, first day of the seventh month. What we can well glean from this passage is a better insight into why we describe these days in Hebrew, yamim noraim, which translates to the days of awe. When we read on in the passage, in particular, from verse 9 and on, and Nehemiah, who was the Tirshata, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all the people, this is after Ezra has read from the Torah, and they have understood the Torah's message, this day is holy unto God, your Lord, more not, nor weep, for the people wept when they heard the words of the Torah. In verse 10, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto him for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our God. Neither be you grieved, for the joy of God is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, Keep silence, for the day is holy, neither be you aggrieved. And the end of the passage is, of course, on a very upbeat, happy note. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. When you understand the real message of this holy day, on the one hand, you can spend the first half of the day crying but on the other hand you learn the message when you understand the words fully you are indeed happy days of awe are not days of sorrow they are special days special days of closeness special days of being truly connected uh, but again Returning to our problems. What new year? It's in the seventh month. And we can readily appreciate on some plane that it can't be the new year, considering what we read in Exodus chapter 12. And God spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, and this we should stress, is the first commandment given to Moses and Aaron on behalf of the nation of Israel a national mitzvah, a national commandment. This month, the month of the Exodus, the month of spring, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Well, that's the first month of the year. This is the seventh month. Note, it's not just a little bit off. It's a half year apart. So, why should we be referring to this as a new year, a beginning of a year, Rosh Hashanah, which means literally the head of the year, altogether? The head of the months in the Hebrew, Rosh Chodashim, is explicitly what we read about the month of spring, not this one. And yet, 
we need not dig very deeply in order to appreciate that things are more complex. Because in Exodus chapter 23, when after the revelation at Sinai, we read for the first time of the cycle of the holy days in the calendar, the three pilgrimage festivals. So in verse 15, we read of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Of course, the Feast of Passover. And that, as we already know, takes place in the month of spring. But then we read in verse 16 that the other two pilgrimage festivals are the Feast of Harvest, the first fruits of your labors which you sow in the field. We've discussed that separately. This is the holy day of Shavuot, the festival of weeks, and the Feast of Ingathering. The Feast of Ingathering, as becomes clear from other passages in the Torah, we won't be focusing upon the Feast of Ingathering today because we're focusing upon Rosh Hashanah, but it becomes clear that the Feast of Ingathering is the holy day of tabernacles, Sukkot. And when does it take place? We read here in Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, that it takes place at the end of the year. At the end of the year. Interesting, isn't it? Well, we know very well that a year is a cycle. When you get to the end of the year, you don't fall off the end. Another year begins. So if this is the time when there is the end of the year, we know it must also be the beginning of a year. But this is clearly not the beginning of the year that takes place in the month of spring at the time of Passover. We'll note that there is another similar passage, the second passage in the Torah that describes the cycle of the pilgrimage festivals. We've discussed in the past that it is reiterated in Exodus after the sin of the golden calf and the reestablishment of God's covenant with Israel after forgiving them for that sin. In Exodus chapter 34, beginning in verse 18, we read again of the pilgrimage festivals. We read again that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is Passover, takes place in the month of spring. And likewise, we read again here in verse 22 of the feasts of weeks and in gathering, the changed description of the middle festival, what we call Shavuot, the festival of weeks, is something we've discussed elsewhere. What's relevant for our purposes is, again, the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. The turn of the year, because as we already saw in Exodus chapter 23, the year turns because one year ends and inevitably another year begins. So, of course, at this point, we realize things seem awfully confusing. Because, again, back in Exodus chapter 12, we already encountered the beginning of a year. Or, to be more precise, the beginning of months. The beginning of months, the first month of the year. But here in Exodus chapter 23, and again in Exodus chapter 34, we read that there is a year that ends or that turns at the time of the Feast of Ingathering, which of course is the month that begins with the holy day that we call Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the year. So there is a kind of beginning of a year here. Just it's striking to consider the contrast. We have not one beginning of a year, we have two. And we'll stress again, they're a half year apart. One is the month of spring, 
the first month. The other is the month in which autumn begins, the seventh month. Passover is the holy day that marks the middle, the full moon of the month of spring. Tabernacles, Sukkot, the feast of ingathering, marks the middle, the full moon of the month of ingathering, the seventh month. When we consider the difference in these two descriptions, there are, are a number of observations that are also very striking. One, we've already noted. In the case of the new year that begins in the month of spring, it is repeatedly described as beginning, as the first. It really is Rosh, the head, the head that is of months. The new year, this time of year, is ironically described not in terms of something beginning, but rather in terms of something ending. As if we have the sense that the new year of the month of spring directs our sight forward, whereas the new year that takes place in the month of ingathering directs our sights backward, not what will be, but rather what was. Another striking difference here, which we've also already noted, is what unit of time is the focus of our attention? In Exodus chapter 12, the focus of our attention is specifically on the month. This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year. The unit of time year appears here, but only at the very end of the verse, indeed in its last word. Whereas month doesn't appear at all in the verses that describe the year ending and turning at the time of the Feast of Ingathering in Exodus chapter 23 and Exodus chapter 34. The only unit of time that appears in these verses is the year. Now, months and years may strike us simply as different sized units of time. But upon further reflection, there's a dramatic difference between them. In particular, when we consider what these units of time serve to enumerate, serve to count. In the case of the month, and we can hear this very readily, even in the word month, the heavenly body that is the focus of our attention is the moon. The moon completes a revolution around the earth every month. And indeed, in a similar vein in Hebrew, one of the words that we find in biblical Hebrew for month is yerach which rather obviously derives from the word for moon, yareach, same spelling. That's the unit of time that we call the month. The year has nothing to do with the month. That is, nowadays, of course, we order our years, at least in the civil calendar, to comprise 12 months that are of arbitrary length, but they're arbitrary because a year is defined in terms of a revolution of the earth around the sun. A year is defined in terms of the sequence of seasons. A year is defined exclusively then in our perspective on the sun, not the moon. So when we consider the difference between the new year that's all about months in Exodus chapter 12, and the new year, or end of year, that's all about years in Exodus chapter 23 and chapter 34, the essential difference is the difference between talking about the moon in the first case and the sun in the other. 
Now, of course, from our perspective on this planet, the sun and the moon are two very significant heavenly bodies. That when we consider what they signify to an earthbound observer, they symbolize very different things. The moon, again, completes its revolution around the earth every month. So we associate it with quick change, with dynamism, with innovation. We talk about the new moon. And in Hebrew, although as I already noted, one of the biblical words for month, Yerach, comes from the same root as the moon, Yareach. The more common word for month, which we already saw in the foregoing passages, where we wrote, read about the seventh month, is Chodesh. Chodesh, as undoubtedly all of the Hebrew experts will immediately recognize, is derived from the root Chadash, new. It's all about something new. Every evening, every night, when you look up at the sky, you see the moon in a different phase. You see the moon in a different position relative to the background stars, relevant to the hour of the night when you're gazing at it. The moon signifies innovation and dynamism. And indeed, when we consider what that new year of months, of moons, is all about, first of all, on an historical note, as we read in Exodus chapter 13, verse 4, this day you go forth in the month of spring. Likewise, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1, observe the month of spring and make the Passover offering unto God your Lord, for in the month of spring, God your Lord brought you forth out of Egypt by night. Number one, the historical note, the exodus from Egypt. Well, if we're talking about dynamism, get on the move, get out of Egypt. Not just the dynamism of moving, but the innovation. A new beginning. A new beginning that is, of course, strikingly associated specifically with the month of spring. Consider agriculturally. Everything is blossoming. Everything is growing. Everything is making its appearance. In many instances, for the first time. This is a new year that's all about being new. Again, dynamism, innovation, a new start. Our sights are directed forward. This is the beginning of the year. And what about the new year that isn't described as a new year at all, but rather described as the end of a year, emphasizing the unit of time, not of the month, but of the year, based upon not the moon, but the sun. The sun doesn't signify for us dynamism. We don't see phases of the sun. On the contrary, the sun symbolizes constancy as so aptly expressed in Ecclesiastes, in chapter 1, verse 9. That which has been is that which shall be, and that which has been done is that which shall be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. It is specifically, if you will, under the sun. There is nothing new. Because the sun isn't about being new. The sun is about maintaining. Not dynamism, but stasis. Not innovation, but preservation. And it's likewise significant to note that just as the unit of time based upon the moon is the chodesh, from the root of new, the unit of time based upon the sun, the year, is in Hebrew, shana. Shana we etymologically relate to, for example, Genesis chapter 41, verse 32, 
when Joseph is interpreting Pharaoh's dream, or more precisely, dreams. He states, and for that the dream repeated unto Pharaoh twice, it's because the thing stands ready from God and God will shortly bring it to pass. Repeated in Hebrew, he shanot, from the same root as shana, as year. There are a number of additional examples we could cite here, maybe just to do it very quickly. We don't want to, after all, repeat ourselves too much. In Kings 1, chapter 18, when the prophet Elijah has his showdown with the priests of the idolatrous Baal, he prepares the altar for God's fire to descend from heaven, first by soaking the altar and the offering and everything round about with water. Pour on the burnt offering and on the wood, and they do so. Do it a second time. Repeat it. Repeat it again. Shnu, vayishnu. They repeated it. Same root as again. Shana, year. And so indeed in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11, in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 21, once again, the theme of repeating. The year repeating, not new, not innovation, rather maintaining the old, preservation. Now, if we ask ourselves, so which of these two alternatives is better? Is it better to innovate or is it better to preserve? Is it better to be dynamic or to be static? Inevitably, of course, the answer is both. You can't have one without the other. We need them both. Perhaps to well illustrate this principle, we consider the name of the holy city, Jerusalem. I already indicated something about the name of Jerusalem in the previous source. I'd like to focus upon what that means. In considering the dual origin in our tradition of Jerusalem's name, to be more precise, of the two components of Jerusalem's name. The first place where we explicitly encounter Jerusalem in the Bible is not by its name Jerusalem, rather in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, and Malki Tzedek, king of Shalem, the way it's usually rendered in English, of Salem. Shalem is a Hebrew word. It means complete. And that this is indeed a reference to Jerusalem becomes clear when we consider, admittedly, the only other place in the Bible where this ancient name of Jerusalem appears explicitly. And that is in Psalm 76, verse 3. In Shalem, in Salem, also is set his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. Now, this is a couplet. Zion and Salem, Shalem, are the same place. So the first name of the holy city is Shalem, Salem. But that's not the only name. That's not even the only name that we encounter in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 22, following the binding of Isaac, Abraham called the name of that place. God will see. Will see in Hebrew, Yir'eh, as it is said to this day, in the mount where God will be seen. Yerae. Now, that place, where is it? Of course, we know from Genesis chapter 22, another name associated with that place. When God said to Abraham, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, 
and get you unto the land of Moriah, of Moriah. Well, where's that? We could do a survey of every other instance in the Bible where this name, Moriah, Moriah, appears. It won't take too much time because there is only one other place. And that one other place is in the second book of Chronicles, chapter 3, verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the house of God at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, Mount Moriah, where God appeared unto David his father, for which provision had been made in the place of David in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So, summarize. Malkit Tzedek called this place Shalem. Malkit Tzedek, as we've noted, in our tradition is more a title than a name. It means my king is justice, is righteousness. By our tradition, he was the title of the righteous Shem, son of Noah. So, one righteous man signifying all of the descendants of Noah, all of humanity, names this place Shalem. Another righteous man, Abraham, names this place Yireh. That's the name that he gave on Mount Moriah after the binding of Isaac. And so in our tradition, God, as it were, has a problem. If he names the place Shalem, then he is inevitably sliding one righteous man, Abraham, who named the place Yireh. If he names the place Yireh, then inevitably he'll be sliding another righteous man, Malki Tzedek, priest of God supreme, Shem. And so the solution, the name of the place is a synthesis of these two. Yireh, Shalem, Yerushalem, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. I'm stressing the point because if we reflect upon the meaning of these two components of Jerusalem's name, Yireh, God will see something future. You need to look forward. It's not here yet. It will be. That aspect of dynamism, that aspect of innovation. Shalem, complete. Same root, I'll note, as shalom, which also doesn't just mean peace. It means completeness. But complete isn't dynamic. Complete isn't anticipating. Complete is static. When something is complete, you preserve it. So which is it? Being dynamic or being static? To innovate or to preserve? Jerusalem's name gives us the answer. It is necessarily both. To consider one additional illustration of that principle that maybe strikes closer to home given our agenda in today's session, the calendar likewise presents us with a challenge. We've already noted when we consider these two units of time, the lunar month and the solar year, we have a problem because the solar year is not some multiple of lunar months. That is, a lunar month is approximately 29 and a half days. That means that 12 lunar months together are approximately 354 days. A solar year is somewhat over 365 days. So how can you possibly talk about a year in terms of months? You can either talk about months or you can talk about years. Consider 
the Gregorian calendar is faithful to the solar year. It completely ignores lunar months. The months of the Gregorian calendar are completely arbitrary and have nothing to do with phases of the moon. On the other hand, to consider a counterexample, the Muslim calendar is exclusively based upon lunar months. Twelve lunar months are defined as a year. It has nothing to do with the seasons. And each of the holidays of the Muslim calendar can take place in any season at all. And what of the Hebrew calendar? As ordained by God in the Bible. We return to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1, because of the practical significance of the mandate, the commandment in this verse. Observe the month of spring, the Torah tells us, and make the Passover offering unto God your Lord. For in the month of spring, God your Lord brought you forth out of Egypt by night. Observe the month of spring and make the Passover offering. Meaning, on the one hand, we already know, as expressed in Exodus chapter 12, we count lunar months. We are indeed bidden, obliged to reckon the holy days based upon the lunar months. Those are the only months that the Torah recognizes. But on the other hand, we are also bidden here in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1, to pay attention to the seasons. Passover must always take place in the spring. How we do this in practice is with the intercalation, not of leap days, as we do in the Gregorian calendar, but rather leap months. So the system of leap months, as we currently practice it, is in a 19-year cycle, seven of those years have not 12, but 13 months. We won't go into the complexities of the calendar right now. For our purposes, it's sufficient to bear in mind that in our reckoning of time, in our adhering to the calendar, the time system, ordained by God in the Bible, it's neither solar nor lunar. It is lunisolar, taking into consideration both the dynamism of the moon and the stasis, the constancy of the sun, both innovation and preservation. Because, of course, inevitably, we need both. And so too, indeed, in the agricultural year, we already noted the month of spring is when everything is blossoming. Everything is growing. Innovation. And then there is the month of ingathering. What ingathering means demands of us bearing in mind what the agricultural cycle is like here in the land of Israel, Mediterranean climate. We've noted this in the past. The harvest festival is when the grain is harvested. That is, it has ripened and is cut. And then it's left out in the field. Left out in the field to dry under the beating of the hot summer sun during the dry season that lasts from the time of the harvest until now. And it is in the month of ingathering that we bring in the sheaves, that all of the produce that was harvested is brought inside before the rains come. So the time of ingathering isn't the time that directs our gaze forward. On the contrary, it directs our gaze backward taking inventory, taking stock. Whence have we come looking backward? Because what has, in fact, arrived is the end of the year. 
And so when we consider what happens at the beginning of this month of ingathering, what happens indeed is we look backward. But we don't just look backward to the previous harvest. We look all the way back. We look all the way back, in fact, to the beginning. That demands of me to note one additional nuance of difference between the new year that was described in Exodus chapter 12 and the new end of year described in Exodus chapter 23 and chapter 34. And that is the new year in Exodus chapter 12 was a new year for you. It shall be the first month for you of the months of the year. When we read of the year ending, turning in Exodus chapter 23 and 34, there was no reference to it being a new or end of year for you because it's for everyone. When we speak of the first month, the month that is remembrance of the Exodus, well, that will be meaningful for everyone for whom the Exodus is meaningful. Everyone who reads the words at the beginning of the Decalogue, I am God your Lord who brought you forth from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, and resonates with those words, can relate to that first month for you of the months of the year. But everyone, all of humanity, can look backward. Can look backward all the way to the beginning. All the way to the event that by our tradition is commemorated by the first day of the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, the creation of Adam and Eve, the origin of humanity. Now, that anniversary, sad to admit, is not just an anniversary of the creation of Adam and Eve, it's also an anniversary of their first sin, which, as implicit in the text, took place almost immediately after they came into existence. But just consider, after the sin, we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, and they heard the voice of God the Lord moving about in the garden toward the wind of the day. They hear the sound of God even after they've sinned, so close. They're able to hear God, and they hear God's terrifying message. In verse 9, And God the Lord called unto the man and said unto him, Where are you? Now, we understand very well, God wasn't asking because he didn't know how to find Adam and Eve. These words, where are you, are themselves the most humbling indictment. Where are you? What has become of you? Where were you just a few moments before and where are you now? What have you done to yourself? But they heard. They heard the word of God. Even after the sin, they were so close. And indeed, as we've noted, even after what follows, which is the more explicit indictment, when God says in verse 11, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? Even after the indictment, and after the punishment, in verse 21, and God the Lord made for Adam and for his wife garments, garments of skins, leather garments, and clothed them, clothing the naked, 
one of the archetypal forms of kindness that God bestows upon Adam and Eve after their sin. Because the relationship isn't over. It's changed. But it's not over. And indeed, as we've noted, in verse 22, when God says, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, and the danger is living forever in an unredeemed state. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim, the flaming sword, the blade of the revolving sword, to guard the way to the tree of life. Except, as we've noted previously, on other occasions. I omitted verse 23 in order to call our attention once again to how, if indeed the message would simply have been the banishment of man, verse 23 is superfluous. You could just read, well, lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. And so he drove out man. Makes perfect sense. That would have conveyed just the wrong message. It would have conveyed the message that what takes place is simply banishment. It's not. Verse 23, therefore, God the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from whence he was taken. Sent him forth. Gave him the mission. He gives all of us our missions. And inevitably, taking stock in gathering means reflecting, where are we? Where have we gone with the missions that God gave us? The unique mission that God bestows upon each and every one of us. Where are you? Not innovation, preservation. Not looking forward, but looking backward. That is perhaps the most apt synopsis of what we read about Adam and Eve, as expressed in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Behold, this only have I found, that God made man upright. But they have sought many intrigues, many contrivances. That doesn't just apply to Adam and Eve. That applies to each and every one of us. God makes man upright. Now what are you going to do? Where are you? Where have you gone? Where are you going? Again, not looking forward, but looking backward, reconnecting with the point of origin from which we came. The essential message of the holy day that takes place at the beginning of the month when the year ends and in gathering takes place, Rosh Hashanah. Now, as undoubtedly all of you know, that necessarily invokes a central theme of this time of year, the theme of repentance. The theme that we know in Hebrew as Teshuvah. So while we do translate Teshuvah as repentance, it is instructive for us to consider exactly what the word means. And in this vein, I am beholden to one of the great scholars of the last generation who made the moving, poignant observation that we can get an excellent definition of what teshuvah rigorously means by considering a passage in the Bible that has nothing to do with sin or repentance. In the first book of Samuel, in chapter 7, we read of the prophet Samuel's career as what we would call a circuit judge. In 
verses 15 and 16. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mitzvah and judged Israel in all those places. And then what? After he completes the circuit. Well, the English translation reads that his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, there was his home. In the Hebrew, his teshuvah was to Ramah. So that's where his home was. Teshuvah, coming home. But not merely coming home geographically, the ultimate homecoming. Coming home to God. We know when we come home, our Father is, is there. He's always there with his arms outstretched, waiting to welcome us. Indeed, it is especially relevant in this vein to consider the closest neighbor of Rosh Hashanah, in the continuation of Leviticus chapter 23, we will admittedly be speaking at greater length of the Day of Atonement of Yom Kippur, Yom Kippurim, in a separate session. But for our purposes presently, just consider this holy day, the 10th day of this seventh month, as a Day of Atonement, you are summoned to afflict your souls and do no work. Because as we read in verse 28, it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before God, your Lord. When we consider what the day of atonement ultimately signifies, we get an additional dimension of insight by considering what we read another Two chapters downwind in Leviticus chapter 25, also pertaining to the Day of Atonement, beginning in verse 8. You shall number seven Sabbaths of years, that is, seven, seven year periods, seven times seven years, and there shall be unto you the days of seven Sabbaths of years, even 49 years. And you shall make proclamation with the blast of the horn. I'll note, here we encounter in the Hebrew, not only the word associated with, with Rosh Hashanah, the Teruah, more on that shortly, but also the instrument, Shofar. You shall make proclamation with the blast of the horn on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the Day of Atonement. And what will be the significance of that proclamation of the 50th year? In verse 10, it shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession. And you shall return every man unto his family. And the summation in verse 13, in this year of jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. That's the cosmic homecoming. But it is simply an elaboration on this central theme of Teshuvah. Teshuvah is all about coming home. Now, when we consider this as the central theme of this new year celebration of the Torah, it contrasts sharply with the way the secular new year is observed in much of Western civilization today. And I have to admit, I use the word civilization very loosely. Let's be blunt. In the godless West today, the manner in which the secular new year is observed is ironically also an elaboration on a passage in the Bible, a very different passage in the Bible. The motto 
as they express it in English, is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And that indeed is exactly what we read in Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and slaughtering sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. Verse 14. And the God of hosts revealed himself in my ears. Surely this iniquity shall not be atoned for till you die. Now, when we consider the difference between these two perspectives on New Year's, biblical versus godless, to an untrained eye, the drunken revelry that surrounds the secular New Year might seem much happier, much more enjoyable, much more upbeat. But of course, when you consider what that message really means, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, there can be nothing more pessimistic. There is no future. There's no everlasting life. There's nothing but the moment, so make the most of it because there'll be nothing left afterward. Ironically, as expressed in Psalm 49, verse 13, that man abides not in honor. He is like the beasts that are silenced, or alternatively, like the beasts that perish. And in verse 21, man that is in honor understands not. Again, he is like the beasts that are silenced, or that perish. Man doesn't abide in honor, and when he is in honor, he doesn't understand. A fleeting moment, and it's gone. Except, you know, ironically, in these words of Psalm 49, there is also great encouragement, because this only applies to people who live like animals, to people who are indeed like the beasts that are silenced, that perish. We can go beyond that. And that is the greatest gift of all, the power to transcend the limitations that constrict the godless man to living in the moment because he doesn't believe anything else exists. Now, again, superficially, the biblical new year, Rosh Hashanah, isn't a day of merrymaking. It's a very somber day. Remember, we saw the passage in Nehemiah that refers to this holy day, and describes the people crying for half the day until the Levites consoled them and told them to stop crying. And indeed, at this juncture, it's particularly germane for us to return to that central motif in the description of this holy day in both Leviticus chapter 23 and Numbers chapter 29. Remember the two ah, the blast of the ram's horn. Acoustically, by our tradition, the teruah is the broken sound, the broken alarm that comes from the ram's horn. Etymologically, teruah is best associated, we've noted in the past, that all of Biblical Hebrew derives from three-letter roots the same three-letter root that we find in a number of passages in the Bible. I've cited a few here just as examples. The root of tiru'ah, ra'ah, or ra, refers to brokenness. 
Here we find it in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 19. Shein which means a broken tooth. And employed as a verb in Psalm 2, verse 9, Tiro'em, if you must break them with a rod of iron, you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And likewise, referring to divine judgment, in Job chapter 34, verse 24, Yaroa, he breaks in pieces mighty men without number. And perhaps most graphically, Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19. In the Hebrew, in translation, the earth is broken, broken down. Again, the tura is acoustically the sound of brokenness, the broken sound, but it signifies brokenness. The tura indeed shakes us, quakes us. It makes us tremble. Indeed, as we read in Amos, chapter 3, verse 6. Shall the horn be blown in a city and the people not tremble? And we come to Rosh Hashanah and we tremble. I must admit, in bygone generations, there was much more of that visceral sense of the terror of judgment. Maybe our senses have become too blunted nowadays to feel it adequately. And yet, while well, that sense of terror, the days of awe, certainly is a feeling that's upon us. I must stress, there's nothing more upbeat. There's nothing more optimistic than that. The eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, is abject pessimism. And the brokenness, the brokenness is simply the necessary prerequisite of being able to build again. If you have a building that's falling apart, the first step in rebuilding is break it, break it down, get it out of the way. Start afresh. As expressed in Psalm 90, you bring man to the crushing point and say, return, you children of man. That crushing point, that brokenness, is a summons for us and a summons that gives us the opportunity to grow, to rise, to be born anew. Return, you children of man. There is, I submit, no more uplifting message, no more encouraging message than the very knowledge that God has granted us the greatest gift, the free will that enables us actively to choose to come to him. Deuteronomy chapter 30. There are many other passages, as we've noted, but this is perhaps one of the most succinct and dramatic in this vein. From verse 15, see, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command you this day to love God your Lord, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances. Then you shall live and multiply and God your Lord will bless you in the land where you are coming in to possess it. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life that you may live, you and your seed. God's begging us. He's not forcing us. When we come home, our Father is there always with arms outstretched to welcome us. But he's not dragging us home. 
He's empowering us to come home by our own volition. The most exhilarating message is our capacity as human beings to act, to choose and to act on those choices and to return to him. And of course, ultimately on that plane, we appreciate that the significance of that trembling, the broken sound of the shofar is merely a prelude to why this day really is such a happy one. Remember, the people were crying, but Ezra and Nehemiah and the Levites told them, stop crying. It's not merely a matter of crying because of being overawed. Rather, on the contrary, as expressed, returning to Psalm 2 in verse 11, serve God with fear and rejoice with trembling. That is, in the trembling itself, you can also be rejoicing. And at this juncture, it's instructive for us to consider that Returning to the motif of the blast of the ram's horn, while again, teruah carries that connotation of brokenness. The instrument of the teruah, the shofar, the ram's horn, carries precisely the opposite connotation. Shofar also, of course, derivative, as all of biblical Hebrew, from its own three-letter root. Shofar signifies, on the contrary, beautifying, perfecting, completing. In Jacob's blessing to Naphtali in Genesis chapter 49, verse 21, Naphtali is a hind let loose, he gives words of, in Hebrew, shafer, same root, words of beauty, pleasant sayings. In Psalm 16, verse 6, the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places, yea, I have a beautiful, pleasing inheritance, shaferah, in the Hebrew. Again, same root. And perhaps most strikingly, most tellingly, in Job chapter 26, verse 13, by his breath, the heavens are perfected. Shifra. Once again, same root. The perfection of the heavens employs the same root in Hebrew as the word for the ram's horn, as the word for the shofar. It's not just a matter of brokenness. The brokenness in this vein is a prelude for the completeness, the perfection, the shofar. And indeed, in that vein, we consider where the shofar appears elsewhere in the Bible. Consider in the second book of Samuel, chapter 6, from verse 12, and it was told King David, saying, God has blessed the house of Obed Edom and all that pertains to him because of the ark of God. And David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom into the city of David with joy. And how is this joy manifest? Well, in verse 14, David danced before God with all his might. And verse 15, so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of God with the blast of the horn and that sound of the horn. It's a sound of rejoicing, a sound of exulting, exulting specifically with God. The homecoming. After all, it's bringing the Holy Ark to its destiny, its destination, the city of David, Jerusalem, calls for the shofar, coming home. And that theme of exulting 
with the blast of the horn is one we find repeatedly in the Psalms. In Psalm 47, verse 6, God is gone up with the blast of the horn. The Lord, amidst the sound of the horn, and the message in the ensuing verses is one of coronation, crowning God. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises unto our King. Sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing you praises in a skillful song. Would anyone be surprised to learn that Psalm 47 is recited in synagogues immediately before the blowing of the shofar, the blowing of the ram's horn on Rosh Hashanah? That's what it's all about. Proclaiming God's majesty. God reigns over the nations, sits upon his holy throne. And we declare that majesty. We, as it were, participate in the crowning of God through the ram's horn. Likewise, perhaps even more overtly, in Psalm 98, verse 6, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, blast you before the king, God. And in Psalm 89, and I must concede that these verses are recited immediately after the first portion of the blowing of the shofar in synagogues on Rosh Hashanah. From verse 16, happy is the people that know the blast of the horn, the teru'ah. They walk, O oh God, in the light of your countenance. In your name do they rejoice all the day, and through your righteousness they are exalted, for you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor will our horn be exalted. So, there really is an exhilarating message here. And that brings me to the final note upon which we conclude. Returning to the words of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 27, we read of the ingathering. In verse 13, it shall come to pass in that day that a great horn, a great shofar, will be blown. And they shall come that were lost in the land of Assyria, and they that were dispersed in the land of Egypt, and they shall prostrate themselves before God in the holy mountain at Jerusalem. Again, Rosh Hashanah, the homecoming. But of course, ultimately, this message would be incomplete without our recalling that the homecoming isn't just for the dispersed of Israel. As we read in Isaiah chapter 56, from verse 6, also the aliens that join themselves to God, to minister unto him, to love the name of God, to be his servants. In verse 7, even them will I bring to my holy mountain. We know where that is. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable upon my altar for my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Says God the Lord who gathers the dispersed of Israel, yet I will gather others to him besides those of him that are gathered. It's all about a homecoming. And it's not, as in Exodus chapter 12, only for you, it's for everyone. Everyone who appreciates what it means to come home to God. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, is the closing verse that we sing at the end of the main service, the Musaf service, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, because this really is the crux of the message. This is the ultimate message, that final homecoming. I will gather them all to my holy mountain. My house will be called the house of prayer for all peoples. Through the blast of the horn, 
the brokenness of that blast. We come to terms with everything. Everything going all the way back to the beginning. And we ourselves return to that beginning. We come home to God. We come home to that most exalted and exalting message. Our Father is waiting for us. Let's return home. Shana Tova, Ometuka. May we all be blessed with a good and a sweet new year. God bless you.